I'll um, I'll shorten the interval that you the, the period that you guys have to answer questions if I have any questions, just in the interest of time. Um, so there are two lectures in this particular series: this posterior and panuviatus, and this is non-infectious posterior and panuviatus. And there's another lecture, maybe I think after your OCAPs, on infectious posterior and panuviatus. Um, so I start with the case. This is an interesting one, not necessarily pan uveitis to begin with, but um, illustrative. So this is a 37 year old African American lady who was referred for a month's history of painless loss of vision. Uh, she's 2200 in her left eye and has a pretty big APD in the left eye. And cool. This is an easy one for you. What do you see here? Gold is asleep. I was muted, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Get left, left eye has some um, uh, kind of fuzzy optic nerve margins, but the most prominent thing looks like some like vascular dropout and vasculitis. There's a little bit of that, but the, the optic nerve is basically an aspirin tablet. Uh, this is the visual field. You can see superior, inferior, arcuate defect with a really large, just basically constricted field. Um, lab studies were negative, specifically ACE and Lysozyme were negative, and PCR of the CSF for HSV and VZV were negative. A chest, chest CT was read as normal. Here's the MRI. Uh, Marshall. Oh my. Um, so, um, well, so there, there looks like there's um, maybe some enhancement of that left optic nerve. That's correct. There is and thickening. And what does the chiasm look like to you? Um, again, on that left side, it looks like there's some enhancement. Actually, bilateral. So that's okay. actually a little scary. So there's there's uh, kind of this ascending optic nerve uh, uh, enhancement uh, and and thickening of the uh, entire chiasm. So IV solumedrol, vision got better. The patient then disappeared for a year, as often happens. One year later, worsening vision and now in both eyes and fluctuating vision in the right. Uh, now she's NLP in the left eye and 2020 in the right. When you're NLP and you have no idea what's going on. Oh, also she had this uh, granulomatous anterior uveitis in the left eye uh, that we could see. And also a lot of vitreitis. So it's very hard to see if there's, this is the band uveitis or posterior uveitis. Black superior arcuate defect in the right. Didn't know what's going on. MRI shows enhancement now of both prechiasmal optic nerves. So as the patient was no light perception and we didn't know what was going on, we decided to biopsy the optic nerve. This is a temporal uh, transconjunctival approach. And you can actually see the optic nerve here, see how thick it is and see how vascular it is. Um, and uh, so we basically just took a big chunk of it because the patient's NLP anyway. And um, what do we see here? Allie. Granny Lomas. Yep, what kind? non kc mm -hmm. And you also see a lot of little white cells. So there's, you can see some of the axons, you can see the uh, non kc granulomas, you can see adventitial tissue, and you can see multiple little lymphocytes surrounding. So the small blue cells are always the, lymphocytes that are surrounding the granulomas. So this, uh, there's delayed type hypersensitivity and also uh, just direct inflammation. <laughs> so in summary, this is extrapulmonary sarcoidosis with a granulomatous, I would say pan sarcoid optic neuropathy, normal chest CT and lab testing. So you can get sarcoidosis uh, with optic nerve and uveal involvement, but with normal imaging and testing. 
Um, sarcoid can present in all kinds of ways. And this is this unfortunate 15 year old kid who showed up with the macular variant, this macular placoid variant of sarcoidosis. And on steroids, the patient did relatively well, was 2100, but always had these, you know, there's a lot of central atrophy. And this is actually a retinitis, a retino, retinochoroiditis that you can actually get with sarcoidosis. And um, it's, it, it's pretty uncommon though. Here's a patient with a, a neurosensory retinal detachment with these little granulomas underneath um, the retina. It looks almost like sympathetic, but this was sarcoidosis. Here's a patient with, Lydia, what does this look like to you? Um, the optic nerve margins are not clear and it mm -hmm. looks like there's uh, some like lesions right adjacent to the optic mm -hmm. nerve. So, so this is actually an optic nerve granuloma. So this is one uh, finding in sarcoidosis that's 100% set, uh, specific, but almost 0% sensitive because it's rare, but it al almost always means sarcoidosis. So this is an optic nerve granuloma. This is a patient who had a Mayan eagle tattooed to her arm and didn't go very well because it's sarcoidosis. Often you get tattoo granulomas. Uh, and often what's been presented to you as tattoo associated uveitis, this patient had both uveitis and this elevated tattoo uh, is actually sarcoidosis. So if you, it, when you biopsy these, these are often indistinguishable from uh, a tattoo associated uh, granuloma and sarcoid. So you, you still have those non caseating granulomas. And this, the, this is her fundus, and you can see it almost looks like birdshot retinochoridopathy. So the clinical signs suggestive of sarcoidosis are many, includes uh, granulomatous uh, anterior uveitis, uh, large or small keratic precipitates. These are kepi nodules, uh, these little uh, iris granulomas that peak uh, behind the iris. Uh, margin. And then you get these Bissaka nodules, which are these iris granulomas that are on the surface of the uh, um, of the iris. You get these Berlin's nodules, which are nodules on the uh, on the trabecular meshwork. And then when they resolve, they form these dent shaped uh, BAS. Um, so they're they're related. You have snowballs in the periphery. Um, macro aneurysms associated with inflammation uh, or periphlebitis, optic nerve granulomata. These choroidal nod nodules are either large or small choroidal nodules in a perivascular distribution or um, periphlebitis. Um, uh, in this uh, candle wax dripping fashion, it's uh, the French word is the tache de bouger or candle wax dripping um, uh, periphlebitis. So what's the utility of ACE and lysozyme? Not very good. How often a chest x-ray change is seen? Quite often, about 70%. But remember that chest x-ray changes are often temporarily discrete from ocular findings. So patients who have pulmonary sarcoidosis may not have uh, ocular sarcoidosis yet, and patients with ocular sarcoidosis may have had previous chest x-ray changes, but in about 70%, those changes will resolve. So why make a diagnosis in the first place? Well, it's useful for prognostication. It's useful because uh, uh, patients with uh, sarcoid uveitis or sarcoid optic neuropathy are at very high risk for neurosarcoidosis, which can often have devastating consequences. This is a 60-year-old gentleman with a history of endophthalmitis and a blind, painful left eye that was enucleated two months earlier, three days vision loss in the right eye, visual acuity in the right eye, the only eye is 2,500. Interestingly, he has tingling of his fingers and toes, neck pain and stiffness, headache, tinnitus, and this is his fundus picture, which may be a little too blurry to be able to tell what's going on. Uh, in, uh, the red free picture 
and the um, uh, OCT Rachel. Oh wait, I can't ask the fellow. Sorry. Never mind. Allie, again. What do you see here? Looks like a like large subretinal fluid. Mm -hmm. What else do you see that's interesting? There's some anterior vitreous schmutz, uh -huh. and the choroid looks like it's probably like thick too. That's right. So you can see the sclerochoroidal junction, and the choroid is very has this undulating contour. Um, and then look at the angiogram. Starts off with this kind of this multifocal leakage, and then ends with or in the middle you have some pooling where there's uh, pooling of the dye from these multifocal leakage areas. And then in the late lates, this is about seven minutes, you see these little punctate starry sky type things. So uh, Ali, just real quick, where do you think this is? BKH. Kind of, sort of. Uh, this is actually sympathetic. So he lost the other eye. So the only difference between BKH and sympathetic is sympathetic is BKH with trauma. As VK, sympathetic is still a bilateral disease. And the reason I brought this case up is the fact that this patient had all of the symptoms, the meningismus, the, the ringing in the ears uh, that patients with acute VKH have. And you can have that in uh, quite a few cases with, uh, with sympathetic, if you ask. Uh, here's a 17 year old Hispanic. Uh, slash German male with loss of vision, pain, headache, tinnitus for several months. Uh, it was treated by an optometrist for anterior uveitis. His vision was light perception both eyes and his pressure was zero. This is his um, anterior segment examination. You can see this fibrin membrane on the surface of the, of the uh, um, of the lens, since he was on Durzol every hour for his an so-called anterior uveitis, he, his anterior segment was quiet and his tapes were gone, but um, he did have these pretty wild looking cataracts in both eyes. And this is not an ultrasound with a poor aspect ratio. This is actually what the ultrasound looked when I applied just a little bit of pressure to the eye because of how low the pressure was. And you can see how squished this is. This is the posterior surface of the lens. This is the anterior surface of the retina. The retina seems partially detached and there's this thick, thick choroid. It's as uh, the choroid is, is approximately uh, you know, three millimeters in thickness. Um, similarly in the other eye. So what is this, Marshall? Um, not so, sure. So yeah. neurosensory retinal detachment, hypotony, thin, I mean, that, thick choroid. Uh, could, yeah, it could still be VKH. Headache, tinnitus. This is VKH. Yeah. So this yeah. is like late, late, late stage VKH. So remember to always dilate people. And uh, this kid, we treated him with two grams per. Uh, per kilogram per day uh, of oral steroids. We put bilateral red asserts in. We treated them with uh, multiple rounds of immunosuppression, cyclophosphamide. And now he is uh, 2,400 in both eyes. He graduated college, works in tech, and leads a center for the blind, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, doing well. So, Here's a 45 year old, um, was it gentleman or lady? Gentleman, actually, uh, who lost the left eye. No, this is a lady, sorry. Who lost the left eye to corneal ulcer and uh, had loss of vision in the right eye. Over here, um, Cole, real quick, what kind of retinal detachment or neurosensory retinal detachment is this? Uh, that's like the basilary detachment. That, that's right. Yeah. So the, here you have the neurosensory detachment. Here you have the basilary detachment with this kind of this outer retinal uh, remnant. And what do you see here, Cole? The early and, and, and mid. 
Yeah, early and mid phase FA, and then in the early phase, you can see these big placoid changes uh -huh. that stain late with a little bit of leakage. Uh -huh. And what's this thing here? What, oh, just, I guess it, that's probably pooling under the. That's that's pooling. So this is leakage, and this is you're correct. This is pooling, and then you have these block early stain late time lesions as well. So, what do you think this is? Uh, this oh this was the corneal ulcer and the other is this SO mm -hmm. as well? Yeah. yeah, this is also sympathetic ophthalmia, and this is kind of more classic with uh with neurosensory retinal detachment. Uh, blocking early standing late um, and this kind of this bacillary neurosensory retinal detachment. Uh, let's get here, here's another patient with tinnitus headache vision loss and this is actually the reason I bring this case up because um, we've actually seen a lot of BKH now in this presentation but, but the reason I bring this up is this person had symptoms for uh, several, several months before she appeared for help. And, you know, now 12 years later, I, I'm still seeing her. And so this is after she was on, this is before she was on steroids. You can see this multi-septated uh, retinal detachment, but on prednisone and cell sept, after a lot of um, time had elapsed without treatment, you can see what happens in patients with, with BKH where there is a multi-septated retinal detachment that is chronic uh, and, and you treat it and then you end up with all of this. Uh, first of all, diffusely depigmented sunset little fundus, but also kind of this uh, uh, subretinal fibrosis. And um, this is how she looks now, but you can see that there's diffuse atrophy in the, in the right eye when the left eye is just, just like this big discoform scar. So that just tells you how important it is to treat uh, VKH rapidly, either with steroids only or steroids and immunosuppression. So VKH is a multisystemic disorder characterized by granulomatous panuveitis with exudative retinal detachments. It's associated with neurological and cutaneous manifestations. And it's basically an autoimmune response to neural crest tissue. So. Tinnitus, why do you get tinnitus? Well, the hair cells in the ears come from, um, uh, come from the neural crest. The RPE comes from the neural crest. The skin it, integumentary uh, manifestations are all neural crest. Um, the meninges are uh, derived from the uh, neural crest and hence you get meningitis. Um, and of course, as is much of the uvea as well, it's Asian, Middle Eastern, Hispanic, Native American populations. There is this HLA association. It's loose. They may test it on your OCAPs, but otherwise it's completely useless. Um, this complete VKH where you have the systemic symptoms, you have incomplete VKH, otherwise known as Harada syndrome, it is probable. Um, we will not go through this in the interest of time, but we have diffuse choroidal thickening and ocular depigmentation. And we've already gone through the fluorescein, this meningismus, tinnitus, and CSF pleocytosis, that's lymphocytic predominant, as alopecia, poliosis, and vitiligo, which are your integumentary signs. And of course, there is that racial predilection. Um, along the Silk Route and also um, Native American, so specifically indigenous American populations. What's the difference between VKH and sympathetic ophthalmia? Just one thing, and that is trauma. Uh, histologically, it's, uh, it's indistinguishable, um, except that it's been said that sympathetic spares the choreo capillaris. This is not necessarily true. I don't know if they changed it uh, in the OCAPs or not, uh, but the fact, the, the, the appearance that sympathetic spares the choreo capillaris is a 
histological artifact. Uh, down Fuchs nodules are those little nodules that you see under the retina. If they show you that with a subretinal, uh, with subretinal fluid, think about sympathetic. As far as enucleation of the inciting eye before one or two weeks after trauma elapsed, that too is something that's probably not uh, valid anymore because we're actually quite successful treating sympathetic with immunosuppression and, um, and steroids and pretty good at recognizing it as well. So not as valid as it used to be. And remember that the number one inciting factor for sympathetic ophthalmia is surgery, especially vitreorectal surgery. <laughs> okay. Here's a 45 year old woman with lots of vision in both eyes. Uh, who do I pick on? Abigail, what do you see here? Um, can you hear me? I've always had audio issues with Zoom. Okay. No, you have, you're like me, you have general volume issues. <laughs> it's true. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So, there is kind of the scarring that's emanating from the optic nerve, um, it, like in the, what I might be better. It looks kind of like serpiginous to me. It is a prison. It's very good. Uh, so now, uh, actually, Ali, remember we saw a patient in the in the in the VA that we thought might be that uh, might be suspicious. So it was mentioned as such. This is the, the so this is what suspicious really does look like. Um, you have kind of this early blockage of the very middle, and then you get this late brush fire staining of the of the periphery of the lesion. And that's an inactive, relatively inactive serpiginous lesion. And in the opposite eye, you see mostly inactive with this brush fire staining, but this particular aspect, see, see where my, uh, my cursor is, uh, that kind of blocks early and stains late, that's an active front um, in, in a patient with separation. So if you go back to, uh, unfortunately, the pictures got kind of cut it off. But this is this is this is a this is what separation looks like. Um, whereas, you know, just non-inflammatory helicoid uh, geographic atrophy emanating from the nerve won't have this peripheral brush fire-like staining. And then, of course, you get all of this diffuse outer retinal loss. How do you treat it? Well, you have to be pretty aggressive. You can use steroids and CELSEP, but um, this is a, one of those diseases where you pretty quickly advance to um, rituximab or even uh, an alkylating agent such as chlorambucil or uh, cyclophosphamide because it's very aggressive. Um, Fundus autofluorescence is pretty useful in surprisingness to tell whether or not there's activity. This is the same eye at different time points where the fundus autofluorescence is just dark, whereas in the lower image with the arrow, you can see that there's leak, that there's kind of this hyper autofluorescence in this front, and this implies a focus of activity. So it's a chronic progressive recurrent bilateral. Uh, uh, devastating disease, often not discovered till late because it's painless and uh, does not have any floaters or anything, but it, it's often discovered when patients have a lesion that crosses into the fovea. It's intercoroidal and RPE, but there's secondary retinal involvement by pathology. It's rare, middle age, male more than female, and largely Caucasian. Um, so this progressive centrifugal extension is multiple crops, there's recurrent attacks, there's often marked asymmetry. And a lot of patients uh, with or without treatment progress to 2200 or worse vision. Um, so it's, it's a pretty devastating disease if not treated. Um, just know one thing about serpiginous is that uh, if you see it, always think about tuberculosis, especially if it's um, asymmetric, but you can have bilateral uh, to be as well. So the one thing uh, that, that that can resemble serpiginous a lot is kind of this uh, serpiginoid tuberculosis. So 
always think about that. Okay, here's a 36 year old with scintillations and an enlarged blind spot. This is a pretty easy one, maybe, I don't know. So Lydia, what do you see here? Uh, and just to help you out, the right eye is completely normal. Yeah, the right eye is completely normal, but left eye, I see um, hypopigment at like the media is maybe a little bit more hazy. Um, optic nerve margins are clear and I see some brighter spots in one eye. Um, I would I would be concerned for something like pig versus other like multifocal choroiditis. Like a white dot syndrome. Yeah, some white so, dot yeah, syndrome. So so these they are these white, yellowish punctate lesions. Thank you for not using hypopigmented because that's not a good term. Uh, but here's um, the fundus out of fluorescence. What do you see here? I see hyper out of fluorescence emanating from the optic nerve mm -hmm. in all directions. That's right. And similarly on the on the FA, you see these. A little bit of periphlebitis, these little punctate hyperfluorescent lesions, and then you see this little in the in the in the fovea of the of the affected left eye. You see this little elevation with this little crew cut like appearance, and the ICG just in that eye shows persistent hypofluorescence. Uh, anybody know what this is? It's just mutes because I did this patient for FA. You did? God damn yeah. it. Okay, yeah, it's it's mutes. Um, so get a unilateral wreath like uh hyperfluorescence on FA, uh similar findings on fundus autofluorescence, and then kind of this more numerous lesions seen on ICG with these little subretinal crew cut. Um uh, lesions, this is mutants, correct. So what do you treat, do for treatment? Usually nothing. Um, with multiple recurrences or particularly severe um, episodes, you, you know, steroids can shorten the course of the disease and you know, people sometimes just wanna go back to work. And um, so it's not, it's not a bad idea to sometimes consider steroids, although typically for your OCAPs, no steroids, self-resolving. So this was first diagnosed. Uh, oh God, what's going on here? This uh, first discussed in '84 by in Chicago by Dr. Jampal. Mostly females, mildly myopic, often have these prodromal flu-like illnesses. Um, there's few vitreous cells, but sometimes if you look hard enough, you see them. And there's often hyperemia, blurring of the optic disc with isolated vascular sheathing. And this is, you often don't see this, but there is this granularity of the phobia. And if, if ever presented with this appearance, do think about mute. Here's a, how old was this patient? I don't remember. Oh, this is a 35 year old patient with 2050, 2025 uh, vision presents with uh, kind of blurry vision and scintillations, one plus AC cell. And it seemed to have vitreous cell and haze in both, in, in just the right eye. Here is the right eye. Oh, sorry, this picture is so blurry, I apologize. Um, but you can see these peripheral kind of bunched out lesions with pigment. And then these other ones that appear a little bit newer. OCT shows uh, diffuse vascular leakage, leakage at the disc and leakage of some of these uh, these nodules. CME, and this is a patient with multifocal choroiditis. I don't know why it's advancing, I'm sorry. But this can be, it can often be a unilateral disease in the beginning. It presents uh, often unilaterally and it progresses to become bilateral. Um, it is in 80% of patients, ultimately a bilateral disease, usually um, female, white, 45 years of age. Uh, 
and like other white dot syndromes, it, uh, it it predominates in people with with mild or moderate myopia. Um, there's often anterior uveitis vitritis. Uh, the lesions are larger than those you, that you see in um, in uh, mutes, where the you know variable from 50 to 350 microns. Uh, the scars then become atrophic. New lesions may arise, so you'll see multiple crops of disease. You'll see peripheral corioretinal uh, streaks. Anybody know what those are called? Uh, it was a Segris, yeah. Schlegel lines. Schlegel lines, Segris streaks. So, see, not Segris streaks, so that's right, Schlegel lines. You see, you see those on multifocal choroiditis. And uh, you see peripheral peripath, uh, uh, pigmentary changes around the nerve, structural complications such as cataract, CME. And, you know, this is another disease that you really want to treat with immunosuppression. This is, um, an ICG angiogram showing multiple lesions that you can see more of uh, should you do an ICG than if you do an FA. Fundus autofluorescence is often quite revealing where you see these lesions, uh, hypoautofluorescent lesions that sometimes precede the appearance of new lesions um, uh, just by, by a microscopy. Um, the fundus autofluorescence lesions in the perifoveal area are often more numerous than if you had uh, just viewed the retina. You can see this little subretinal hemorrhage just to remind you that it's pretty common. Uh, about one third of pa uh, patients with, or actually 15% of patients with multifocal choroiditis will develop choroidal neovascular membranes and then subretinal or submacular fibrosis, such as in this patient. Treat with steroids and immunosuppression. Uh, with immunosuppression, using an anti-metabolite in particular, there is a far lower risk of posterior pole complications because these are what cause vision loss, CME, and coronal neovascular membranes. And there's a far, far greater risk, a lower risk of, uh, of severe vision loss. Uh, you can treat CNVMs with uh, laser, either thermal laser or photodynamic therapy. Intravitreal steroid can sometimes make these inflammatory CNVMs go away. Uh, Anti-VEGF and submacular surgery had been popular in the late 90s, but don't do it. Um, there's a very high rate of patients going LP or NLP. PIC is basically um, multifocal choroiditis without vitritis. Now it was also described in 84, and there's often a unilateral acute onset of blurred vision. And just remember, it's about the same. It's healthy, young, white uh, women, mean, mean age of 29, and also moderate myopia. So PIC is just like multifocal choroiditis to some extent, except that uh, there's no vitritis or anterior uveitis, although now when people look at swept source images on OCT, you do see some posterior uh, vitreous cell. There's posterior pole lesions, 100, 200 microns that progress to atrophic scars and a very, very, very high rate of coroidal neovascularization. I would say most patients with PIC present in fact with coroidal neovascular uh, uh, membranes, uh, and then you notice the uh, punctate lesions in the peripheral macula. And recurrences, of course, are common. Angiographically, the first thing you see with PIC is early hyperfluorescence, late staining, and uh, choroidal neovascularization. And you see more lesions on ICG than you do on angiography. Um, can you treat these patients with immunosuppression? Yes, if you have bilateral disease and one eye is severely affected and the other eye is threatened, then yes, you can consider it. And it is in fact useful, but uh, conventionally you treat these with anti-VEGF and intravitreal steroids. Here's a 32 year old 
two weeks after COVID-19 vaccination, loss of vision and scintillations. And you can see these little placoid changes in both eyes, it's bilateral, and you see basilary retinal detachment in both eyes, kind of this thumbprint like hypo autofluorescence, and then blocks early stains late in this placoid fashion, persistent uh, hypofluorescence on ICG. What is this? Mm. Ampy. Ampy. That's right. Apmapapi. It, I, it's a, it's a, it's the worst um, acronym I've ever seen. But anyway, so Ampy is, um, so the, this COVID-19 vaccination may have been, a, uh, or the COVID-19 infection, or, uh, no, this actually was infection, not vaccination, sorry, was actually, could it have been a red herring or could it have been just a, a, a you know, a precursor to immunogenicity causing this. We don't know, but we're actually pres we're we're writing up a series of cases with COVID um, and inflammatory eye disease. But yeah, um, this gentleman went on to get worse and uh, had more of these hypo hyper and hypo. Uh, autofluorescent lesions in the scockade like pattern. Now what? So he hasn't formed any, he hasn't created any scarring. Will this get better by itself? Probably, but he's pretty disturbed now. So I put him on steroids and three weeks later, prednisone continues to get better and resolves. Now, this is actually a controversial topic as to whether or not you would treat MP with uh, oral steroids. Most people say, oh, yeah, it'll just get better by itself. My contention is that some patients in, um, in AMPI go on to develop uh, outer retinal loss. And then those patients will end up with permanent uh, visual loss. It may still be 2020, but they will often have the scotomata and you know, loss of. Um, in, you know, loss of contrast sensitivity. So I think for AMPI, it's worth treating with steroids because it certainly does no harm once you've ruled out syphilis. Um, so uh, once again, something for your OCAPs, you say it's self-limiting and it gets better by itself, but in real life, you probably want to treat these patients. So what, this was described way back in the late 60s by gas, it's young, healthy adults, mostly, uh, it could be male or female. Um, one third have a prodromal viral illness. This is a HLA predilection, but once again, it's completely useless. HLA B7 and DR2. And there's this rapid onset of blurred vision, it's bilateral and asymmetric often. Um, there's mild vitritis. And there is an association with cerebral vasculitis that you can have up to 10% of patients with AMPI have cerebral vasculitis. So if you have headaches, meningismus or neurologic uh, deficit, immediately get an MRI and consider a cerebral angiogram uh, and treat with steroids. Um, there is an association with Wagner's poly, uh, uh, pan steroidus, GIA sarcoidosis, and ulcerative colitis. Okay, so this is an 18 year old with lo loss of vision in the right eye and bilateral extremity numbness. Um, so, Cole, what do you see here? Did you see me? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, let's see. In the OCT kind of subphobial and paraphobial, you have some outer retinal <laughs> loss and irregularity. Mm -hmm. And then kind of these big black coid, uh, deep cori retinal lesions in, in both eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And this is what it looks like in autofluorescence. So you see multiple lesions. She had no symptoms in her left eye and her right eye. Uh, no symptoms from these lesions, which are of indeterminate age. And this is the new lesion that brought her in. And what does this lesion do? The new one blocks early and stains late. And then you see these peripheral lesions out here and out here in both eyes in her asymptomatic left eye. So what's this goal? And in a young person, think about like syphilis, but is this like the ampigenous variant? That's right, so th this is this is relentless black red. So ampigenous is basically multifocal ampi with, uh, uh, you know, with scarring. So this is relentless blackoid or ampigenous uh, retinopathy. And this patient had a bit of a twist because her lower extremity weakness and tingling was actually because of bilateral Fontaine strokes, which in turn was secondary to uh, cerebral vasculitis. Uh, so whereas it has been described with ampi, it has not been described with relentless blackoid. My guess is it's because it's rare. Um, my guess is because ampigenous is rare, so therefore it's hard to form an association with anything. But this was the first time um, that cerebral angiography ever showed uh, a relationship between relentless blackoid and uh, cerebral vasculitis. And so she actually did really well on rituximab vis-a-vis -vis her, her uh, vasculitis, her cerebral vasculitis. But her lesions continued to get worse. And so she uh, was treated with uh, uh, a T cell inhibitor, an anti metabolite, and uh, an anti TNF agent before she quieted down. Now she's doing really well off all her medication for one year and still 2020 in her left eye, unfortunately, 2050 in her right eye. Here's a 33 year old woman with scintillations. Uh, I won't ask you guys, but this this is another example of relentless blackoid. Only this time, it was far far more severe. Um, and it's it's it is a disease continuum uh, when it comes to ampi. There are numerous lesions. There's ampi with multiple lesions. There's multiple crops of disease. This is may not be true anymore because we have identified two patients now with cerebral vasculitis, uh, the best treatment is unknown. Often these patients need uh, immunomodulation with cytotoxics, such as alkylating agents, often rituximab, often anti-TNF agents, often multiple agents. This is a 72-year-old lady who presented with persistent vitritis in both eyes after cataract surgery. A week later, had a vitrectomy with intravitreal antibiotics, worsened uh, and was noted to have whitening and vitritis in the left eye and was referred for possible retinitis. So, Marshall, what do you see here? Um, so, looks like they're might be a bit of a hazy media. The, mm -hmm. the right eye, you can see some um, vasculitis, especially superiorly, and maybe a few hemorrhages there. Mm -hmm. um, the left eye, the uh, nerve is pretty pale, and there's a placoid lesion inferiorly and some a few other hypopigmented spots, but they don't like. Over here, you see some retinal whitening. Did you mention that? Um, yeah, just vasculitis, but yeah. Yeah, but see how the retina seems. Yeah. Baylor. Sure. And now it's a little more evident, right? Yeah. So what um, do you think this is? Um, well, with retinal whitening, I would worry about any infectious causes. Um, so like, Specifically? Um, so like VZV, HSV, CMV would be... Right, so necrotizing uh, retinal... Uh, yeah. Necrotizing retinitis. So, yeah, okay, so we thought that too. We said, okay, this is ARN. So we did the usual tapped intravitreal Gansaclovir, Valtrex, two grams three times a day, 
started on prednisone, improved after this treatment, but then three days later, the whitening seems to have spread towards the macula, but have, have uh, kind of dissipated out towards the periphery. And then we noticed that there's all these little peripheral white lesions as well in the inferior periphery. And there's vitritis in the left eye with this, this old black white lesion. So we start to rethink our diagnosis. Um, now, Marshall, what do you see here in the OCT? Uh, so there's kind of loss of the architecture of the layers and some diffuse mm -hmm. retinal thickening, a little bit of an ERM. I, now, can you see that with R? No, absolutely, you can. You can see this loss of architecture and this homogenous kind of um, soul plague, uh, loss of architecture, uh, kind of infiltration almost. So continue to get worse. Uh, she ended up with this with submacular fluid, which is, you can see with ARN, but not, not unusual, but not typical. What else could this be? Like lymphoma? That's right. So we did a vitreous biopsy and, um, hang on, sure enough, uh, there were large B cells, my D88 positive, um, IGH gene re rearrangement anomalies, and, um, uh, inverted IL-6, IL-10 ratio. So this was a patient with um, a primary vitreoretinal lymphoma, which is a subset of primary central nervous system lymphoma. Both are high-grade, large cell, uh, quite anaplastic and quite aggressive. 15 to 25% of patients with primary central nervous system lymphoma eventually have ocular involvement, but when the converse is looked at, 56 to 90% of patients with uh, BVRL, primary vitreoretinal retinal lymphoma, end up with CNS disease. So this is uh, obviously made worse if it's bilateral disease. So it's very, very important to screen these patients and treat them systemically should you, even if you do not find CNS uh, foci. Now, this is controversial, but in uh, at OHSU, every single patient with bilateral lymphoma is treated systemically. Whereas at the Huntsman, I believe they're a little more conservative and uh, bilateral lymphoma is often given it. Patients are often given a choice as to whether or not to uh, treat systemically or not. Um, conversely, choroidal lymphomas are, are small B cell lymphomas with uh, kind of a, a low grade tumor, and they have no association with CNS disease, but they do have association with um, with retroperitoneal um, and other systemic lymphoma. Often affects elderly patients. The median survival time for patients with PVRL is fifty eight months, so they usually go on to form uh, CNS lesions. Um, it's rare for this to uh, be multifocal to the sense that it's systemically seen outside of the CNS. And the prognosis for each is worse than non Hodgkin's lymphoma. The diagnosis, as you see in this particular patient, is often delayed. Steroids may decrease inflammation, giving you a false sense of security that you're treating the right thing. Um, just remember that when you do a vitreous biopsy, take them off steroids for a couple of weeks because uh, steroids can decrease your cell count and decrease the sensitivity of your vitreous biopsy. Um, often you'll see blurred vision and floaters. The AC is usually quiet. There's no posterior synechia. So you see a lot of evident inflammation, but no posterior synechia. Think about lymphoma. The vitreous cells and haze may be in superior locations and they look weird. They look like they're in sheets and they're whiter than normal cells. Uh, the cells can grow along brooks. Uh, you have plaques uh, and you can also have these interesting PED-like changes along the RPE. Um, so the gold standard for diagnosis is obtaining lymphoma cells from the eye. 
cytopathology and histopathology are useful. Uh, a high ratio, more than one of IL-10 to IL-6 is indicative of uh, PVRL, although you have patients with without lymphoma who can have that inverted ratio as well. All patients should have a brain MRI and lumbar puncture. Um, local therapy does consist of intravitreal methotrexate. Conventional treatment from the 1970s and 80s is uh, twice weekly intravitreal methotrexate. Um, but you can actually do methotrexate and rituximab on a monthly basis. And the study that showed that this was effective had a lower rate of complications, but in my clinic, I find that rituximab, which is a chimeric anti-CD20 antibody, uh, so half murine, half human, um, you can end up with pretty bad inflammatory reactions with uh, occlusive vasculitis. I've actually driven one patient into new vascular glaucoma from rituximab injections. Um, we have a paper on that. So it's not the safest thing, but it is, it is useful as an adjunct to treatment of uh, PVRL and can decrease your treatment burden. Um, I currently do my best not to use rituximab. There are no large prospective studies to show whether or not systemic therapy is necessary for all PVRL. Bilateral disease, uh, of course, should point you in that direction. Uh, regimens for when the CNS are involved often involve multi-drug treatment, rituximab-based. Our chop is conventionally like the first thing that you use. Ibrutinib can be used as an adjunct and as maintenance therapy. Uh, most uh, uh, most uh, regimens also involve methotrexate, intravitreal methotrexate, and systemic. So for primary central nervous system lymphoma, median survival is two to three months. This is old data uh, aggregated from, uh, from over 30 years. Now with rituximab-based therapy, that, that survival is much better with a median five-year survival of about 50%. This is the last case. So, the reason I showed you lymphoma is just because you have posterior uveitis doesn't mean you should forget about masquerades. This is another patient with a uh, masquerade type uh, uh, syndrome. Abigail, what is this? Shout it out. Anybody? Syphilis. Plus. Yep. Yep. This is syphilis. So, this is. Um, an unfortunate and famous patient who actually passed away from a combination of alcoholism and uh, untreated neurosyphilis and peripheral neuropathy. Um, but yeah, this is perhaps one of the worst cases of uh, placoid syphilis that I've ever seen. It was bilateral, it was progressive. And um, uh, just to show you that even Syphilis can. Uh, syphilis was actually a pretty high, uh, a, a pretty common cause of death in, in the 16 and 1700s. So, uh, all the way up to before penicillin. So, uh, know this too uh, as another masquerade syndrome. Looking at uh, posterior uveitis, always check for neoplastic disease. Think about neoplastic disease, and think about uh, infectious disease. All right. I think that's it. Any questions? One thing that I haven't included in this presentation because it's a rather large topic and I've covered in another lecture previously is birdshot. I know we covered birdshot in our OCAP uh, review, but uh, do read about that because they do like to ask about it. And it is one of two meaningful HLA associations in uveitis. Uh, the other uh, HLA-A29, the other one being HLA-B27, and maybe uh, B5 and B51 for, um, for Betchets. But uh, do read about birdshot a little bit. Okay. All right. Well, enjoy your conference, guys.
Um, 